Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Mansell. I'm the interim director and academic director at the School of Public Policy. And with me, I have Dr. John Meddings, who's the dean of the Cummings School of Medicine. And on behalf of both schools and the larger university community, I want to uh, send uh, or, or uh, uh, give you a warm welcome for attending this event today. Um, this is a very important topic. Uh, the demand for high quality health care just keeps going up and up in an environment of increasing fiscal and financial constraints. And the critical element to that solution to that uh, issue is innovation. So um, we're very pleased to have strong representation from the panel that was struck in June of 2014 by the federal health minister to uh, look into this issue. Um, it is a very well developed um, um, uh, paper. Um, it uh, not only was led by Dr. David Naylor, but uh, in addition had a very strong uh, panel made up of Neil Fraser, Francine Girard, Toby Jenkins, Jack Mintz, and Chris Power. And uh, I want to acknowledge their valuable public service. If you could just stand up and be acknowledged and join me in thanking you immensely for all the work on that panel. <clears throat> Within the School of Public Policy and the coming School of Medicine, health policy research and outreach is, rapidly, is a rapidly growing area of focus. So we're very pleased to host this keynote address on a topic that is at the core of achieving high quality and financially sustainable health care in this country. So over to you, John. Thanks, Robert. Um, I think it's absolutely amazing, first of all, that all members of the panel are here in Calgary today. So I am tickled pink by that, I have to say. So the Cummings School of Medicine is really proud to be a partner uh, with the School of Public Policy in bringing this event to you. And at the Cummings School of Medicine, we actually have a vision, and that vision is to create the future of health. That's what we go around saying. And the future of health is very different than the healthcare system that we have today. I'd love to have you come and speak to us a little bit about it, but I can tell you that the future of health is going to be that of precision medicine, precision public health, some of the parts that the uh, that the inquiry deals with. Now, I've been given two tasks today, and the first is to, is to have a, a brief word about Cy Frank, who was mentioned many times this afternoon. Um, this report was dedicated to the memory of Cy Frank, and Cy was a friend and a colleague for many of us. For me, it was for almost 30 years. I've known Cy very well. He passed away earlier this spring, and I think there's a very good reason that this report was dedicated to the memory of Cy Frank. Cy had a passion of always looking towards the future. He was never fixated on the past. He always wanted to do things better in the future than we were doing today. And he had two passionate beliefs that I share, actually. And the first is that evidence matters. We have to base our healthcare system on the bedrock of evidence, and Cy was passionate about that. And the second thing that he was passionate about was that healthcare transformation comes from health research. So to provide the innovation and the transformation of our health system that we desperately need today, and I think today pointed out why we so desperately need it, we have to learn new ways and new methods of providing care. And research matters, matters to all of us. But Sai had another skill, actually a secret weapon, if you will, he had to be one of the most persuasive people I've ever, ever met. Some people have vision. Some people are incredibly bright. Some people form strong arguments, but truly great people couple those same skills with the gift of persuasion, of consensus building. And Sai, I have to say, was a truly great person, and he would be honored to have this report done in his memory. So thank you for doing that. And the second thing I was asked to do was to introduce today a hero of mine to give this talk, and that's Dr. David Naylor, who truly has been one of my heroes for many years. And you'll understand why. David Naylor is a physician, he's a medical researcher, 
He's the immediate past president of the University of Toronto. He received his MD from the University of Toronto in 1978. It actually was one year before I did in 1979, which is why he's been a hero of me. He got a PhD from Oxford in 1983 where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. He became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1986 and he joined the Department of Medicine at his alma mater at the University of Toronto. He was promoted to full professor in 1996 and those of you in academic circles would recognize that's a fairly rapid progression through the ranks. He was the founding chief executive of, of officer of the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences, ISIS, and I think everybody in the, in, in the room knows about ISIS. He then became the Dean of Medicine at the University of Toronto, not a small job, followed that up by being the President of the University of Toronto. It's a spectacular number of achievements. He's the co-author, as you might imagine, of about 300 scholarly publications. He's provided counsel to governments, healthcare associations, institutions and enterprises and abroad for more than 25 years. He was chair of the National Advisory Committee on SARS in Toronto, and you can imagine how much work that was. And as a member of the panel that undertook the review of federal support to R&D in, in 2010 and 11, and I remember reading that report quite carefully at the time. It was truly a remarkable report. So I'd like you to welcome David Naylor tonight to speak to us on unleashing innovation under a new federal government. Has anything changed? Thank you very much, Dr. Mettings, for that very generous introduction, and Dr. Mansell for your warm welcome. And thank you all for your very gracious welcome to Calgary. On behalf of the members of the Federal Panel on Healthcare Innovation, I have to thank everyone here for uh, inviting us to join you in the discussions uh, today. Uh, I would say that the afternoon sessions were extraordinarily rich and informative. I was ferociously taking notes. At one point my hand got tired, I gave up and I went to typing on the iPad. I had too many scribbles. So I, I think we are all learning from uh, your insights and your questions. And we're very pleased to be engaged in dialogue with you tomorrow as well. Now this uh, address is being webcast and so since the audience is different, I am going to reprise some of what Francine Gerard shared with you earlier today. I hope you'll forgive me for that. But I think you can also think of this as a setup. It'll be a fairly rapid stroll through the, the report in its entirety. And then the real event will be when Dave Taylor begins to poke and prod me and all of you have a go. And I will in turn try to invoke my fellow panelists and call them forward to deal with the most difficult questions in the audience. So panel members be forewarned that you will be called upon. Let me say that uh, this report was a team effort um, you can read the bios of the fabulous panelists uh, with whom I had the privilege to work in the report itself. There's a skeleton sketch on the screen. Uh, with 15 minutes to summarize uh, 126 pages, I'm going to simply let you look at the slide and uh, you've met these individuals, I believe, in many cases. But I would be remiss not to acknowledge that uh, it was inevitable, John, that we would all turn up since uh, three of the panel members have strong ties, obviously, to Calgary. And of course, the late great Cy Frank was another touchstone. At one point, we really had a majority of the panelists who had very strong roots and ties right here in Calgary. So it is propitious and fitting, of course, that we're having this discussion here in Calgary. About Cy, uh, much has been said, but I simply want to echo uh, the fact that uh, we were certainly uh, greatly saddened uh, to lose Cy. He was an incredible contributor. And like many here, I think uh, we're saddened by size absence, but I can tell you the panelists continue to be warm by fond memories of this fabulous friend and colleague. The panel's mandate uh, has been presented by Francine earlier. It will be known to those of you who skimmed through the report in any way, shape, or form. I simply would note that we spent a great deal of time traveling across Canada. We met with healthcare stakeholders, including provincial and territorial officials, who were very welcoming, I should add. We reviewed literally hundreds of submissions. There was extraordinary interest. All the major stakeholder groups submitted material. And as you may have heard earlier, we were regaled with inspiring stories of local creativity, 
commitment and innovation, along with many expressions of frustration about the state of Canada's healthcare systems. So let me open with a very high altitude view, if I may, of what the panel heard and read and saw. First off, it was clear that, as we all know, Canada has healthcare systems that are excellent in many ways in many places. But we were left with a very strong sense that Canada is losing ground compared to its OECD peers. You've heard some of the evidence in discussion earlier today. There is no doubt that we are spending well above the OECD average, and that in many performance metrics, we are entirely middling. A second observation at high level was that healthcare everywhere seems to be evolving quite rapidly. It's changing in response to an aging population, the revolution in information technology, greater engagement by patients in their own care, and of course, unprecedented advances in medical science. Many stakeholders told us very directly that Canada is not well positioned to respond to these forces, and we concluded somewhat regretfully that they were right. Third point, we know that Canada has outstanding health professionals, truly excellent healthcare providers. But in the current set of very poorly integrated systems, these well-educated and committed individuals struggle frequently to deliver the consistently high quality care that Canadians deserve and that they pay for with their tax dollars. Fourth, as noted, the panel was told that a great deal of positive change was happening at the local or regional level. That was the good news. The bad news was that while some modest spread might occur locally, systematic scaling up of these innovations at the provincial or national level was a very rare occurrence. And fifth and finally, it was clear to us that the provinces and territories were making real progress in cost containment. It's also clear that they're beginning to chip away quite aggressively at more fundamental health care reforms. But in a tight fiscal climate, which is what they've been creating, the understandable priority for provinces has been allocating scarce dollars to delivery of frontline health services. And so it is that notwithstanding some innovative work done under the auspices of the Council of the Federation, provinces and territories have lacked catalytic funding, and in some cases, a critical mass of expertise to make substantial changes in the way their healthcare systems work. As one observer put it to us, you can't change something as complicated as healthcare from the corner of your desk. This slide summarizes very concisely where we ended up. You've heard earlier and probably read that many stakeholders called on the federal government to create some type of arm's length national innovation center. This would be neutral terrain to promote collaboration with and among provinces, territories, and stakeholders. It would concentrate some expertise in healthcare innovation and evaluation. It is a center that could also support new delivery models and accelerate the scaling up of best practices and policies across the country. Many submissions also strongly endorsed an innovation fund, which we discussed this afternoon, with the view that it would be specifically earmarked to promote change. Now, if you glance at this slide, you'll see the five keys or themes for healthcare innovation that we identified, and I would suggest they are more or less self-explanatory. I don't think any of the panelists feel any of them are particularly novel, with the possible exception of some of the uh, coverage of precision medicine, which is new. But if you read Canadian healthcare reports from past years, going back even 15 years, these are recurrent themes, which in itself, I think, is grounds for concern. Now, I am going to set aside the last two areas for federal action listed on this slide. That's partly because time is short, but the more important reason is that one of the key proposals in that section is a new refundable health care tax credit. We were very fortunate to have Canada's wizard of tax policy leading that work, Calgary's own Jack Mintz, and Jack will be chairing a panel tomorrow on that topic, and I simply don't have the chutzpah to talk about tax policy in front of Jack Mintz. <laughs> now, uh, what are the enablers to break the gridlock? First, as Francine outlined in, a, I think, a very concise summary, the proposed Health Innovation Fund would be created to support sustainable and systemic changes in the delivery of health services to Canadians. And Greg Marshall had made the point earlier today that the focus had to be on systemic change, not on individual services, 
That was certainly the vision that the panel shared. The idea is this fund would support provinces and territories to strengthen their healthcare systems with fundamental reforms, and it would also collaborate with stakeholders to scale up innovations. I want to re-emphasize, please note, these funds would not flow on a formulaic basis. They would not be transfers. It would flow according to the potential impact for sustainable change directed to coalitions of the willing, jurisdictions, institutions, providers, patients, industry, and committed innovators of all backgrounds. We were very firm about the caution needed in ramping up this fund, because these are tax dollars hard earned by our fellow citizens. Any fund would have to be deployed effectively and efficiently with rigorous selection criteria, performance parameters, and milestones. And I would point out here that we were also clear about the need for there to be sustainable scaling up by ensuring that the funds were deployed in partnership with provinces and territories that would make a commitment to follow through if an evaluation showed that the innovation was indeed not only promising, but proven. Now as to the quantum, I think that is defensible, uh, as modest as some said today. Canada spends about $220 billion a year on healthcare. We spend a modest amount on research. We spend a smaller amount on what might be called development. And we spend very little indeed on turning R&D into value generating innovation. And that in itself is another problem. There's another piece of calibration that Francine also mentioned. If you take out the debt servicing costs, which seems fair, and you focus on the Government of Canada's investment in people and programs, in the 2015 budget that was $265 billion. So if we were to get to the $1 billion in steady state imagined in this fund, that is again less than one half of 1% 1 of the relevant federal spending per annum. A reasonable investment we felt given what is at stake for every Canadian. The new innovation center imagined in the report would draw in staff from the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, which has been very much focused on this mission. The Canadian Patient Safety Institute and other outstanding but small pan-Canadian healthcare organization like CFHI that could uh, scale up its own work. And after a transition period for completion of existing projects, Canada Health Infoway, for all the obvious reasons. And I should say further to discussion earlier today, we did debate whether to fold in CIHI and felt that it was best positioned outside as a barometer for the system, but working in close partnership with the new Innovation Centre. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to deal with these five themes uh, rather telegraphically. Patient engagement and empowerment. This is sensible, grossly overdue for all the obvious reasons. We don't have a lot of randomized evidence on this front. We have a lot of quasi-experimental evidence and some before-after studies, which all tend to show that these strategies have positive impacts on costs and outcomes. We believe that there's also a lot of positive experience across the country and that it makes very good sense to proceed with appropriate scaling up and evaluation on three levels of patient engagement, individual, organizational, and system-wide. And you'll see on this slide some detail on the recommendations, including the focus on mHealth, virtual care, and patient portals. Now, this question of integration is a very important one. This could be deemed the fatal flaw in the Canadian healthcare system, incomplete vertical and horizontal integration. It's been a challenge identified in one report after another going back, in this case, some 30 years. And we saw substantial symbiosis worldwide in the degree of integration in healthcare systems and their receptivity to innovation. Now, given how long we've been talking about integrated delivery systems in this country, given their potential to even introduce some managed competition into the system. It is disappointing that so little has been done. The panel was firmly of the view that it was time to break down the silos wherever possible, to amalgamate budgets, and to reward our fine professionals in ways that let them work to the full scope of their competence and creativity. In that regard, I would emphasize that integrated systems also allow modernization of the healthcare workforce and the best deployment of the full scope of talents and skills of health professionals. We also felt these reforms were particularly pertinent to First Nations and Inuit health services, which are, as you heard this afternoon, and we concurred, the most fragmented of all the services provided. 
I'd be happy to discuss further in the Q&A uh, some of our recommendations regarding Canada's Aboriginal peoples. Another theme, another evergreen theme, health information technology. Here I have to say that in some provinces we're still building backbones when other nations are already onto meaningful use in virtual care. I've suggested, no offense to the orthopods in the audience, that this is like the difference between back surgery and cognitive behavioral therapy. They are not the same thing at all. And we accordingly envisage the short-term continuation of Canada Health InfoWay to have bridge funding for these pro provinces that were still lagging. But thereafter, as the agenda shifts from infrastructure to uptake and applications, the vision of the panel was that InfoWay would merge into the new innovation agency and all further funding for its partnerships would flow through the innovation fund. Now, precision medicine, as John Metting said, is a huge area, and I am again going to give that a miss because I think we can talk about that in the Q&A if you like, uh, but I would simply want to emphasize at this point, I've been around healthcare for 30 plus years. There is a revolution brewing at the convergence of molecular medicine and bioinformatics. I've not seen anything quite like this in my lifetime as a physician. Canada has no plan to ensure safe and cost-effective uptake of these exciting but expensive advances. And I would say uh, this particular university and the O'Brien Institute are at the forefront in thinking about how precision medicine can be transported and translated into the realm of public health. So a very exciting area, a very exciting time. Canada is way behind the curve from a national standpoint. Now, on this one, I'm sure we have uh, entrepreneurs and business people in the audience who have firm views about procurement, reimbursement, and regulation. Again, this afternoon we had some very interesting and challenging discourse. Uh, I want to spend the minute I have for this topic focusing on an area of procurement that I think has caused a lot of public debate, not least in the election, and that is the evergreen question of pharmacare. The panel took due notice of Canada's high per capita outlays for pharmaceuticals. And they look to be approximately second in the OECD. We're an outlier in that we're pretty much the only country with universal health care that has inequitable and uneven coverage for prescription pharmaceuticals in the way that we do. And we were also concerned, of course, by the cost pressures with the very rapid emergence of many biological therapies driven by this world of precision medicine. So these gave us pause. What also gave us pause is if you look at what's going on with our high per capita uh, prescription drug costs, it is not simply a function of price. There is also a question of prescribing patterns. So the panel certainly supported very strongly the principle that every Canadian should be able to afford the drugs that are necessary for their health care. We felt the starting point was demonstration of improvements in pricing. Well, debate continues about the best design for some type of pan-Canadian drug coverage. And we are also particularly concerned that absent integration and alignment of incentives, a new stovepipe of spending on pharmaceuticals may not have the anticipated cost control effects. A lot of assumptions have gone into the projections. Some fine work has been done, but we really have more preparation to do to lay the table for us to get to a much more equitable form of insuring prescription drugs. So both prices and prescribing patterns are going to need attention here with alignment of incentives. Now, last of the themes. I think the slide is self-explanatory. It will resonate with many. I think, uh, as Cy Frank would say, as uh, Neil Fraser would remind us, publicly funded healthcare, universal healthcare systems, have the potential to generate enormous economic value not just simply through what they do to produce a healthy and productive citizenry, that's an old concept, but in the way that they foster the adoption and spread of innovation and support entrepreneurs and made in Canada businesses. So this contribution to economic development was something we took very seriously. We were well aware of the recommendations in the 2010 review of federal support to R&D, that they were more generic and felt that they would be customizable take into account some of the unique features of healthcare enterprises. And so you'll see in the report that much of the focus there is on how we could have Health Canada work with stakeholders 
inside and outside the federal government, including the provinces and territories, to develop a whole of government strategy and a national strategy to accelerate Canadian commercial activity in the healthcare field and really make the healthcare systems much more receptive to innovation on all fronts, including innovation that could be scaled into services and products exportable worldwide. So summing up, I think all of us, despite the frustrations that we've had with the healthcare systems of Canada, take some continuing pride. We see these systems as a source of social solidarity. We know that they provide essential services to millions of Canadians every week. But the reality is that the scope of public coverage in this country is exceedingly narrow. And as I said earlier, our overall performance by any international standard is at best middling. There are very real reasons to be particularly concerned in the next 10 to 15 years as the baby boomers retire, as dependency ratios shift with aging of the population, and as advances in medical and information technologies begin to disrupt our time-honored patterns of healthcare delivery. And that was one reason why we saw such an urgent need for a renewed commitment to interjurisdictional collaboration and for political resolve on the part of all Canadian governments, provinces, territories, and the federal government to work together to improve Canada's healthcare systems. I want to emphasize that the panel was fully cognizant of the frustrations of successive federal governments in dealing with healthcare. There's been a lot of Medicare mud wrestling through the years between the provinces and territories and the federal government and a lot of squabbling about money. We understood why the current government felt a 6% constant escalator was unsustainable in a time of weak economic growth. But I do want to emphasize the reality that we all felt had to be confronted. Canada's national plan for health care systems, national plan, was created by conservative and liberal governments through three landmark pieces of legislation in the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1980s. The federal government is part of the solutions to this set of problems. And so it was in hopes of breaking the latest gridlock that we recommended this new model for federal engagement in healthcare built on prudent investment through an innovation fund and catalysis through a major center for innovation in healthcare and healthcare improvement, based as well on an ethos of partnership, not oversight partnership with the provinces and territories and based as well on that shared commitment I mentioned earlier, a commitment across all jurisdictions to scale existing innovations and to make fundamental changes in the incentives, culture, accountabilities, and information systems that we use in Canada's healthcare systems. Now, two final points. The panel was independent, as I think is well known. We were utterly nonpartisan, either as regards political parties federally or the debates between the federal government and Canada's 13 subnational jurisdictions. We provided what we believe are practical and eminently affordable recommendations. And as Francine mentioned earlier, we remain convinced that action on these recommendations can make a meaningful difference to Canada's healthcare systems over the course of the next decade. That's a good segue to my second point. We had the good fortune to work with a very fine health minister in the Honourable Ron Ambrose, another daughter of Calgary. However, as fate would have it, our report was unequivocally rejected by the Right Honourable Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister. It didn't fit his platform. It didn't align with his philosophy of federal disentanglement from Medicare. Since then, the people of Canada have spoken and a clear majority decided that they, in turn, didn't see a good fit with Mr. Harper's platform or with his ideology. That's one question that I think we'll have to ponder in discussions tonight and in the future, is how the report aligns with the platform of Canada's new government, a liberal majority led by Justin Trudeau. And here I would point out that a platform is not a place where you are going to put forward a strong endorsement of patient engagement and empowerment, or talk about innovation and integration. You'll talk about things that are a little more accessible, like home care and pharma care. You'll talk about seniors. These are things that can be sold on a doorstep when you're canvassing for votes. But I would suggest to you that if you look at the platform, you'll see that it is, in fact, quite friendly to the agenda that we put forward, including Mr. Trudeau's letter to the premiers, uh, sent in the first instance to Pierre Claire from Quebec, 
saying that there would be an early first minister's conference, that healthcare would be on the agenda and that innovation would be a key theme. We also had reference to coordination and collaboration to scale best practices in areas such as precision medicine. So there are a number of touchstones to the report that I think uh, are present in that platform. But as always, time alone will tell what our newest political masters do with these latest ideas about how to improve Canada's healthcare systems. With that, I look forward to our collective discussions and to interacting with Dave Taylor in the Q&A. As I said, the panel members are all here except the late and very lamented Cy Frank. We are indeed deeply honoured and very grateful to you for having hosted us and for your consideration and discussion from which we have already learned a great deal. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, your work is not done. We have an on-stage conversation with Dr. Naylor, and then following that, we'll take questions and answers from the, the audience. So to help us with the on-stage uh, conversation, we're very pleased to have uh, Mr. Dave Taylor. Almost rhymes with Naylor, but uh, different. Um, <clears throat> Dave came originally, or started his career, which spans broadcasting, journal journalism, and politics, uh, started his career in journalism and broadcasting in London, Ontario, and Ottawa. Moved out to Alberta about the worst possible time, 1985, just in time to enjoy the next rebound of a fairly deep recession. <coughs> um, but uh, started in uh, 95, uh, well actually that time I think he was a director of a radio station for quite a few years and then 1995 uh, got his own radio show, uh, actually I think it's 11 years, 9 years, something like that, uh, as a talk show host on CHQR and actually until May of this year he was back broadcasting. So he's really well known but one of his big claims to fame is that in 2004, he was elected as a liberal MLA in Calgary Curry, something that was just unheard of back in those days. And he served as a liberal MLA until 2010. And then he joined the Alberta, was actually instrumental in setting up the Alberta party. And then um, that lasted uh, two years, 2011, 2012, and then went back to his first love, which is broadcasting. So great history, um, uh, well suited for this task. Dave, thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, please come forward and the stage is yours. Are we on? Can you hear me? Good. So I actually retired again, retired from politics in 2012. I uh, got talked into going back into, uh, into media, into talk radio, and retired again at the end of May. So I'm just about on the cutting edge of being a crotchety senior here. <laughs> You're not the only one. In, in, in all seriousness, um, Having, having covered this story for so many years in so many different ways in the media, having lived with it uh, at a completely other level in politics for eight years, I'm deeply concerned. This system that we have is, is in need of a lot of repair. You're right, we are losing ground relative to other countries. Uh, we have a huge tsunami of baby boomers entering their senior years, uh, and there's this sense that the whole thing is stuck in the mud somewhere. Do you think you can get it unstuck? I, I, don't, I don't think that anyone has uh, that ability, uh, uh, you know, even, even with a large team in a single jurisdiction. I think that this is going to take uh, a national effort, which is why we are absolutely convinced that the federal government has to get back into action. And it has to do it as a partner with the provinces and territories. But even within each of the provinces and territories, we have to have a whole new ethos, a whole mobilization to take place, where providers, 
patients, stakeholders, civil society come together to say, th this is an iconic set of programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at times we get silly, we define ourselves against our American friends by virtue of Medicare, uh, you know, that, that's a bit much, but uh, it does matter to this country, I think. It, it's a valued part of our identity. And I, I think there is a tipping point coming where we're going to see this decline accelerate a little bit uh, under demographic and technological pressure. None of this is going, there won't be a crisis, but this will just be a slightly faster decline. Mm -hmm. If we don't take intelligent steps, we're gonna see a lot of fraying at the edges, a lot of push for multi-tiered systems, which you know some may favor, many don't. So it's time to get on with it, Dave, but there's, there's no magic bullet, it's just going to take a massive amount of work across every jurisdiction, and it's, you know, whatever you think of the results of the federal election, one thing that I think is welcome is that the current government is committed to getting back to the table in some form. Yeah. And, and you've mentioned in, in numerous occasions since your report came out in July that it's going to take political resolve. Um, it seems to me that not only does it take political resolve, it takes popular resolve as well. We all, uh, you know, the pollsters tell us that the thing that we're most proud of about this country is our health care system. Yeah, so there's, there's a certain amount of um, self-delusion there because we, we have spent so long measuring ourselves against the Americans. You know, it's, so, you know, it's, you know, the little dog and the big dog. So, you know, the, the big dog has, uh, you know, something wrong with his ear. So you say, oh, look at the big dog's ear. Well, the big dog has something pretty seriously wrong, and that is inequitable and inefficient healthcare. Mm -hmm. And we've all been pointing at that, you know, gloating a bit, uh, because we tend to be overshadowed by our friends to the south. And I think it's time to get over that. With Obamacare, America is making rapid strides. It's still going to be chaotic. But at least it's pluralistic, creative chaos mm -hmm. with lots for us to learn as they go through the various experiments. So I, I do think you're right to say popular resolve is critical. I do think we're going to have to get over our sense of superiority to the folks to the south and start to look at Europe. Uh, but most importantly, the populace can't be stampeded when providers and healthcare unions, as is going to be the case, and provider associations, including those in my profession, are going to be very active, get uh, you know, their dander up and start agitating, saying all these cuts are going to hurt healthcare, restructuring is going to hurt healthcare, uh, your care will be affected. You, you know, that, that ability to, to panic people with a bit of a sense of, you know, it's money from the government or your uh, well-being and even your life at stake. We need people to calm down and be willing to back a period of reform and change, and that's a tall order. Mm -hmm. It's a tall order. Do you think it's a Do you think it's a particularly tall order in this province because we've been through so much restructuring of the healthcare system? We went from 200 hospital boards to 17 health regions, and then when that didn't deliver the the desired efficiencies, we went to nine health regions, and then when that didn't de develop or deliver the required or desired efficiencies, or perhaps when it got a little too uppity for its political masters, it got merged into one super board. And every time, it seems, we've lost ground. The reorganization or the restructuring has, has set us back. Any comment on that? So I, my mother told me never to come into someone's home and comment on the furniture. <laughs> so, what do you think of this, Jim? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be a little careful here. Um, I, I, I think that uh, this circus movement that's been happening, not just in Alberta, but also in Nova Scotia, is completely understandable. But to stay with the circus analogy, it's a sideshow. Mm -hmm. The real reforms have to happen on the front lines of care with changes in payment modalities. We did regionalization across Canada in the 1990s after the big push on integration of care. Yeah. And we thought we were changing the system. Well, we changed some of the governance, but we never really put you know, provider budgets or pharm pharmaceutical budgets in the hands of regional health authorities. We never really, in some cases, fully integrated home care. We still had a set of silos, but we had them under regional boards. So mm -hmm. you can make this one board, 10 boards, 20 boards, 100 boards. 
Um, what matters is a certain number of organizations that are budget holding accountable for the health care and ideally the health standing and, and status of a set of families that are enrolled with that organization, which is what you see in the U.S. integrated delivery systems. Um, whether you did it through managed competition or whether you did it through you know, regional monopsonies, one way or another what matters is you have to have the discipline of accountability and integration of budgets. And just to continue to do the circus movement won't fix things, it's the budgeting and the accountabilities that count. Mm -hmm. With your healthcare innovation fund, with the agency that you would set up, that you would like to see set up, where's the accountability in there? How, how is that going to work? Yeah, so that's a, a fantastic question because the panel was very concerned about how these funds could roll out and what could be done to make sure that you know, citizens were getting value for money. So several elements, several safeguards were envisaged. But a lot of work would have to be done on implementation of machinery. And Greg Marshall then, you know, earlier today said, a lot of inside baseball needs to happen. But among the things that I think are critical, first, you can't flow the money unless you've got some sense that the project or plan or idea is sustainable and scalable. And we were struck by what happens in the U.S. Under the uh, work done by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is part of the modeling for this center we're proposing. Funds go for states to do innovation projects. Once that project has been rigorously evaluated all the way along, and it's proven that it produces value, better outcomes, cost savings, all those good things, the state is signed on to accept that evaluation and to scale that particular project. We'd want the same kind of accountability with the provinces and the territories. Money goes in, we help get this thing implemented, evaluated, and you would say the provinces and territories sign on in mutual interest, right? It's in their interest to say, okay, let's get this going, let's scale it. So the, the, you have this kind of circle of accountability based on evidence and outcomes. And similarly, you, know, you would want to have people come in and look at the innovation fund and say, what's the, what's the overall return on investment? Is it doing its job? The one caution I'd put up, Dave, is a classic Canadian trap would be to say, after 18 months, this thing isn't working, or two things failed, therefore we should stop. The reality is, if you're innovating, some things are going to fail. Unless you take some risks and try th some different things, uh, you know, you're in trouble here. Yeah. And some things may not only uh, work, but work with a lot of friction and noise. Stakeholders may not be happy. Again, politicians may not like it, population may not, not always... Uh, be thrilled with the media's portrayal of it, but you've got to have the gumption, the courage of the early morning to drive ahead with these things, even if it turns out they don't work, but they're potentially high yield, even if they produce a lot of friction. Mm -hmm. So all that has to be evaluated at some point by third parties coming in, international advisors to say, hey, we've been doing this in the UK and the US. Yeah. How does this Canadian upstart work? Mm -hmm. And to give it a public report card. Yeah, what's good for the goose is good for the gander here. Lots of accountability and public reporting. Okay. Um, we wanted to open this up to your questions as well. I understand that there are a couple of roving microphones kicking around in the audience here. And so um, what I would suggest is simply, if you have a question, uh, put your hand up, and I'll attempt to recognize you and send, uh, send a roving microphone person around your way. And, uh, and we'll open the questioning that way. And we have one question over here. Uh, if you would give us your name, please, first of all, and then your question. Roger Thomas. From your report, which three randomized tri controlled trials would you like to see performed to test your innovations? Or if we already have the in information in a systematic review, which systematic reviews would you like to see implemented? What, a, what an interesting question. I would have to sit down and think for a considerable period of time to decide which three I would put at the top. So I'm going to do something a little uh, dodgy, forgive me. Um, i give you two examples of trials cited in the report which were not put into practice and which in essence we are saying should be put into practice. Um, the first of them is supported by systematic reviews as well. That's the Burlington Trial of the Nurse Practitioner. 1974, Walter Spitzer was lead author, Dave Sackett was senior author out of McMaster. 
uh, interesting small but compelling randomized trials showing that 70% of the work of a family physician could be done by a nurse practitioner with patient satisfaction, physician satisfaction, nurse practitioner satisfaction, all very good, equal in the two groups, and with all the process and outcome measures looking as though they were as good or better. So having done that, and having had it replicated in many countries, we proceeded in Ontario to shut down some of the programs to train nurse practitioners, and the rest of the country was slow to adopt it. And 40 years later, when you look at the Commonwealth scorecards, we're still low in Canada, in, uh, among our 11 peers or so, in terms of the use of nurse coordinators in primary care. I, I take that as a bellwether for an endemic problem. If you don't integrate the system, if you don't align incentives, if you don't bundle payments, you don't let professionals work to the full scope of their competence, you not only make life unhappy for patients and for the nurse practitioners who are underused, doctors are left doing things that they really can't ultimately be happy doing, except the fee schedule rewards them, which at some point gets to be a Sisyphean way to live a professional life. So that's one. The second one would be a, a, a fabulous randomized trial, the biggest and best still done in, in terms of health service delivery, and that's the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. Also an oldie goldie, you know, initiated in the 70s, completed in the 80s, a landmark. You randomized groups to an integrated delivery system, then called a health maintenance organization, and full coverage, Canadian style fee for service insurance, and two forms of copay. And you try to figure out whether these different models of delivering care are equally effective or not. Now, there's all kinds of sub-studies. There's probably 40 papers out of that, that randomized trial. And there's wrinkles all over them. I'm going to iron out the wrinkles here at risk of doing some damage to the science. But the bottom line is the integrated delivery system delivers a 25% per capita saving with negligible differences in outcomes. There are some you know, that would suggest with low-income groups, you have to help them navigate an integrated delivery system, but they're, they're minor. And I will say the copay, if it was big enough, led to savings almost as large, but with had some adverse health outcomes. Not overwhelming, but worrisome. Bottom line, we knew 20 years ago, we had randomized evidence from an amazing experiment that integrated delivery systems were a better answer than our current mode of delivering care. And yet we didn't proceed, as I said from the podium earlier. So those are two examples of randomized studies in health service delivery, which are utterly compelling, gave very clear cut results and that we haven't acted on and it's 30 years on. Okay, next question. Can you hear me over here? No, you can't, how about now? It's good. We have a question from the live stream. What are some solutions for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples to address the fragments you speak of? Uh, thank you. We, we have a, a substantial number of recommendations uh, focused more on First Nations and Inuit than on Métis health at the moment. But, uh, and, and I could spend a fair bit of time on the, the challenges surrounding the standing of Canada's Métis people. But let me focus only on the, the area under federal jurisdiction, primarily in the current arrangements, and that is first, the First Nations and Inuit. A, a critical problem is, as was mentioned again earlier this afternoon, this disintegration of the system. And you have you know, handoffs between the provinces and territories on the one hand and the federal government on and off reserve travel arrangements, particularly applicable for Inuit, but also First Nations in the North, that are completely inefficient. Budgets that are capped so that funds run out. Uh, referral requirements that you know come out of a kind of, uh, to use a term from this afternoon, a Kafkaesque manual of, of rules. And when you look at this, you, you, you're quickly struck, I think, struck by the need to change governance and clean up the operations to streamline the handoffs. From the standpoint of governance, if you look at the Alaska precedents, there is ev there's reason to believe, and I think some evidence emerging that says, if you have trilateral governance involving the state, 
the federal government and the relevant First Nations that you get far better accountability and clarity because the trilateral governance deals with the handoffs and you have some sense of a, of a global budget in the hands of a unified agency dealing with those health services. We break it up in Canada and we don't have the, the self-governance piece right at all. BC has embarked on a very bold experiment that needs a careful evaluation that tries to do more or less what Alaska has done. But I would say the, the two key themes are fixed governance to avoid this fragmentation of accountabilities and then get in and deal with all the handoffs and the decision rules and this sort of m micro rat's nest of red tape to actually produce something that is centered on the patients, on, on First Nations and Inuit families and their needs rather than on dealing with provider priorities or administrative uh, exigencies. And so those are the two big themes in the report. Okay, let me pick up on that idea of that BC experiment. Let's, let's fast forward into an uncertain future and say, yes, it worked just fine. How do you propose that we take that then and replicate it across the other 12 subnational jurisdictions? So there's one where um, I don't think that you can simply say, you know, an, an innovation fund is the, or agency is going to drive that on its own by any stretch. You immediately get into very sensitive issues of interprovincial and in, in, interterritorial differences in which of the First Nations or Inuit groups are involved, mm -hmm. uh, what their view is of their appropriate self-governing role. So you have to, you're gonna have to grind that one out jurisdiction by jurisdiction, Dave, and there'll be no quick fix. But if BC works, then it may be possible, depending upon the level of trust in each province or territory, to begin to do something similar. Okay. At least a healthcare innovation agency exists to say, hey, everybody else, look over here. Well, the other, thing, the other thing you could do is, you know, if there's unease, you could say, well, bring in the agency to do a signature evaluation of the BC experiment, arm's length, mm -hmm. and they can report out to the people of Canada and especially to our fellow citizens who are First Nations and Inuit or Métis and say, look, we've had a very careful look under the hood. This is the real deal. Here's a few bumps and problems but this is something that we can scale up if you're willing. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Braden Mounds from the University of Calgary. Uh, so you've just started a new integrated health system. Physicians want to get paid. Who holds the money and how do you disseminate it to them? There are several different ways to come at that. It's a, a fantastic question. So one of the, the common views would say Put it in the hands of, let's pretend it's regional, we're going with the regional monopsony uh, frame. Put it in the hands of the region. And they will work with physician groups to decide how it flows. But there's another way to think about it, which is closer to the Permanente model. People sometimes forget that it's Kaiser Permanente, and Permanente is a physician-led organization. And so you could also say, here's the physician services budget. There's your Permanente equivalent. This is the Medical Staff Association. And here is what we want you to deliver in terms of services. Here's your contract. Here are your accountabilities. And here's the budget. Now, here's a council, a multi-professional council, because other professions are going to be involved and they're going to have budgets too. And let's get together and sort out what the most cost-effective way is for delivering these services. So that you don't just try to keep all the money in-house you can cross-purchase. Nurses can cross-purchase, you can cross-purchase. Physios, OTs. You could actually have a very interesting and dynamic and I think pluralistic approach to sharing those budgets with the professionals sorting out among themselves on the basis of evidence what the most value generating way is to deliver the bundle of services or set of services required by the region or by the paymaster. So you can, you can either keep it central or you can disperse it. And for one, I'd love to see both methods tried and evaluated because my hunch is if you actually had not only these payment envelopes in the hands of the docs, but, but more of a shared envelope with other health professions for certain types of care, you would get better team care, you'd get better scope of practice, you'd get better collaboration, and you'd get far better value and outcomes for patients. 
Is anybody in Canada doing this integrated healthcare delivery system well? It's a loaded word, well. <laughs> no. No. There, there's uh, some experimentation with bundled payment. Yeah. If you think about the Obamacare reforms, a lot, a lot of that is driving towards integration by taking episodes of care. So you take someone who's had a hip replacement, and you'll say, okay, we want to pay you for your outcome, and we want to track this patient from the day they come into hospital for the procedure to the day they're up on their feet and, and deemed fully off rehabilitation. And we'll pay you across that continuum a single sum of money. Mm -hmm. And we'll bonus you if the outcomes are good. That's the concept be behind bundled payment. It really says the whole enchilada is in the hospital, the, the surgeon, the internist, the no physio. No fee for service. No fee for service. But they carve it up and it becomes a fee, mm -hmm. but it's carved up according to who does what and what the value is, and it's a very different mode of doing business. So what we have in Canada is limited experimentation with bundled payment, and some of it, I think, uh, is you know, beginning to noodle along in, in interesting ways here in this province, but it's very early days, very early days. Is it very early days? in and of itself, or is it very early days because we've been, been proceeding perhaps too cautiously? It's, it's very early days because we have uh, put our healthcare professionals, nurses, uh, and doctors, and healthcare workers, and we're generally on a slump and boom cycle that corresponds to political priorities and the electoral cycle. Yeah. So, you know, one minute we're holding the line and saying we've got to do reforms, the next minute the economy uh, ticks up and the uh, floodgates open and there's money on the table and reform interest stops. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're under a minute. We have one more question, if we can make it a quick question and a quick answer. I hope it's uh, possibly a quick answer. Susan Lee McKinney, I'm a, a primary care physician. I'm in a community practice. And one of the, um, the concerns that we always have in an integrative system, which I personally believe in, though, is the issue of legal liability and uh, the shared liability from a professional perspective. Yeah. Speak of that in under 30 seconds? Yes, I can. <laughs> um, the Cana Canadian Academy of the, of the Health Sciences report on scopes of practice, which I suspect you're familiar with, has pretty substantial coverage of some of these regulatory and legal issues, and I am absolutely confident that you can work those through in fact, it may turn out that as we begin to rethink uh, CMPA, about which uh, Michael Dechter had some things to say today, and the whole medical malpractice scheme, whether we end up with no fault or not, I don't know, but go in some different directions, I think you're gonna find there's, there's actually better coverage for us in shared care model than in this sort of single exposure of the physician as the point person for litigation. So okay. I think it can work. Um, and I, I accept the concern, but I think a lot of people have worked on that in a lot of places over a lot of years, and it's manageable. And we will have to wrap it up there. Dr. Naylor, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Well, thank you, Dave and David. Uh, very interesting. Um, on behalf of John and Cummings School and the School of Public Policy, our thanks to David, you and the entire panel coming out. I know this is really, really valuable. And to you, the audience, thank you for coming. And I know you want to carry forward uh, discussions on this. This is really important. I think as more and more provinces realize that health care is going to be rapidly going over 50% of their total budget, in which case there may only be one department, Department of Health, not much else left, maybe roads, I'm not sure that this takes on all more importance and you know I, th I think maybe there will be a time when like that when the stars will align and they will look at the report and we will be forced to actually uh, take some real action on this. So thank you uh, everyone for coming. Uh, tomorrow morning I'm told, uh, at least according to my agenda, breakfast at 7.30. Program starts at 8.15, that's correct, thank you. Have a good evening.